Uh, why don't we stand? We're going we're gonna to open in prayer and then get right into the Word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. God, we thank you that uh, it doesn't return void. It accomplishes what it's sent forth to accomplish. Uh, speak to our hearts. Change our lives in Jesus' precious name and help that preacher. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So, uh, you know, um, we were talking a little bit about our values last week, and we said that values are true spiritual riches. So the word riches is actually the, the acronyms for our values as a church. So R stands for relational. We believe that we want, God wants us to be relational. He had 12 men. He brought them together so that they might be with him. So he poured his life into his disciples. We see that in scripture. Okay, I stands for innovation. We want to be a church that is willing to innovate, to keep the message pure, but be creative to bring the message to our culture. Okay. Uh, C stands for character. We believe character is important. That's why we have the Highway to Wholeness course and the Encounter Weekends and discipleship courses and small group. Why? Because we believe that character is important. We want to grow in our relationship with God in integrity, okay? And then the next one is honor, which is H. And we want to learn to honor one another. If you have an issue with your brother, the Bible says go to that person, make things right. There's a whole bunch in the scripture about honor, correct? And the next one is E, which stands for a spirit of excellence. We want to have a spirit of excellence. And the last one is servant leadership. And so these are our five values. So let's see if we can all say them. R is relational. I is innovation. C is H is E is and S is servant leadership. And so I want to talk a little bit about excellence today. And there's so much to be said about excellence, but we're going to talk about it in one department or one area today, and that is excellence in giving. We want to talk about what the Bible says a little bit about giving. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 16 and 17, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. How, how much scripture? All right. Uh, uh, what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives, it corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. OK, I want to say this is very important. This book was written around 64 A.D. And at that time, the New Testament church was still using Old Testament scripture. How many know that Christ was was concealed in the Old Testament? And so what Paul and Peter and John were doing when they were writing the New Testament, they were, they were showing the shadows of, this was Christ revealed in the Old Testament. And that's what the New Testament is, is, is the revealing of what was concealed. Okay, So they were reading from the Old Testament scriptures, and we don't see a lot in the New Testament uh, about reteaching of the principles of worship. We don't see it, right? You don't read through the New Testament. It doesn't tell you that you're to clap your hands and shout with joy and worship the Lord with the dance. And worship the Lord with the stringed instruments. How many see there's no pattern there? Because the New Testament church would just do what the Old Testament church did. That pattern of worship was already established. And I believe in the same way the pattern of giving and even the pattern of morality and different things, the, the new church, the New Testament church would model the Old Testament church. How many see what I'm saying? And in, in the area of giving, there's, there's really a lot to learn about money in the Bible. There's a lot to learn about budgeting. I know budgeting is important. Uh, you know, uh, making sure that you master money, because if you don't master it, guess what? You become its master, right? And so the Bible actually, and I don't know if you're aware of this, the Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, on the topic of prayer. How many have heard sermons on prayer? Okay. I mean, there's fewer than 500 verses on the topic of faith, but there's more than 2,000 verses on money. That's real, that's 15% of everything G, that came out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospels was on the topic of money and possessions. Okay, More than his teachings on heaven and hell combined. So money is important. The reason why the topic of money is important is because there's a fundamental connection between our spiritual lives and how we think about and how we handle money. Right? And it's so easy for us to put our faith in our finances and, and in, in our occupation and what we do for God and the income that's coming in that we stop relying on God. And I find this interesting. If you go to second world and third world countries, we say, man, they're having revival. They're having miracles. People are getting saved. Supernatural things. Why? Because they don't got money. So they have to learn to rely on God as their source. Okay, and so I want to read a passage of scripture here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30 to 33. 
And it says here, Jesus is speaking. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have such or so little faith? He's speaking with his disciples. So don't worry about these things saying, you know, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? How are we going to retire? How are we going to put our kids through college? And what, well, don't worry about all these things. What we wear. The next verse says, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. If you're a believer here, let me see your hand today. And so Jesus is saying, don't let these things boggle your mind down because your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. Seek first, or seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. And so, the Bible says we're to seek first the kingdom of God, and that really means, okay, um, uh, it, it actually is God's way of doing things. When you're seeking the kingdom, it means you're seeking the culture, or the way things are done in heaven. Right? What the Lord's prayer was, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. I want to say this about the kingdom of heaven is that God is very generous. Okay? God, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. He gave the best that heaven had and he gave it ahead of time as a first offering. Not even and he didn't even see the harvest of sons and daughters yet, but he gave it because his heart is generous. And so something happens in our hearts when we become believers, there's a generous spirit that is born in us. Now, it's our choice whether or not we're going to suppress that or not. But the thing is, there's a generous spirit. Because how many know the Holy Spirit is generous, right? There's a law called the law of seed time and harvest. We read about it in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. And it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. And so we see this. If you're going to sow a seed, right, you sow a corn seed, you're not going to get an apple tree, you're going to get a corn cob, right? Because that, you're going to reap what you sow, okay? And Luke chapter 8, or 6 verse 38 says this, Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom, Okay? This is what Jesus says. Do you believe Jesus? For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So if you give generously, guess what you're going to reap? You're going to reap generously. And this doesn't just have to do with, mo uh, with uh, money. It has to do with, with everything. Like if, you, if you're friendly to people, guess what? You're going to reap friends. If, if you love people, you're going to reap love. If you're generous, you're going to get generosity. And so... Jesus is giving us and laying us a foundation here, okay? So today, as we talk about the principle of the first fruits, as we talk about giving, we need to realize that it's not the law of giving. Say, it's not the law of giving. It's the grace of giving. It's not that I have to give. It's that I get to give. I get to I get to provide for the kingdom. I get to give what already belongs to God, okay? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 10. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Okay? You must each decide in your heart. I say this, say, I have to decide in my heart. See, if you're not giving from the heart, it, it doesn't matter. See, God wants your, your motives to be, he wants you to give with the right a right motive, okay? So look at this. Each one must decide in his heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. You know, we've been to meetings in the past, maybe some of you can relate, where there was a lot of pressure put on from the pulpit. You know, you need to give, and if you give, God's going to bless you, and it was like pressure, pressure, pressure. How many of you have experienced that? And you're sitting there going, I feel we should give, but I don't know if it's God, or I don't know if it's, maybe I feel pressured, I'm not sure. And so we, we made a decision, I said to my wife, I said, when this kind of thing happens, we're going to go home and pray about it. And in a few days, we still feel that we're supposed to give. How many know God's never in a rush? He's never in a rush. So if anyone tries to pressure you, it's not God. 
And so we go home and pray about it, and we feel in a few days that, hey, we really feel we should support this ministry. Well, we can write them a check and send it in the mail, okay? So Paul is saying here, don't let anyone pressure you. Don't respond to pressure. Give from the heart. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need, and then you will always have, say always have, everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forevermore. Okay? For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide increase of your resources. Say, God wants to increase my resources. And then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. And the more that you get this principle of generosity, there's this cycle of, of a harvest that will begin to come and it will produce in you a heart of generosity. So you become a radical giver. You know, God provides seed. And I remember one time, some of you heard this story a few years ago, but we went into a gist store, and there was a couch in that gist store, a nice leather armchair couch that was sitting there. And my wife went in there, and, and uh, she was so excited to have a European store in Kingston, and she's going through the store, and I'm, I'm shopping with her until MMS sits in. It's a disease called male mall syndrome. Kicks in, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not feeling good, honey. I'm going to go sit in the car. So me and my MMS go and sit in the car, and I'm waiting. I'm looking at the time. I know the store closes at 9. It's 10 after 9. I'm like... The, the, the parking lot is emptying out. And then finally, about quarter after, I see my wife coming out. She's like, doing this. I'm like, what's up, right? I said, you know, you're, the, the, I'm thinking like the poor employees have to go home, honey. And, well, they didn't say anything. In fact, they were following me around. And, and they said, here was the deal, okay? The, 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 last, the last person, we had this agreement that the last person who leaves the store that day is going to win this leather armchair. So, so she said, we got a leather couch. I'm like, yes. So they said, you know, come back tomorrow, pick up the couch and everything. So she, she told me, the moment she told me and sat in the car, the Spirit of God dropped something in my heart and said, that's seed that you're going to sow. I said, I really want a leather couch, Lord. <laughs> like we got like, you know, something we got from, you know, some secondhand store. This is a nice couch. I can lean back, you know, I can watch TV. This is great. And, uh, but I really felt it strong. And I said, well, and then the Lord dropped a picture in my mind of a, a couple that went to our church. He's a professor at Queen's University, and she, she works for the mental, um, uh, medical, medical industry, and they both are making way more money than I could dream of making. And I'm saying, God, why would you want me to give it to them? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm trying to reason with God. Like, Lord, you know, if you wanted me to give it to somebody, then, you know, why would, why would you have me give it to them, right? And I'm, and, but okay, Lord, if you said. So the next day we put it in our van and we bring it over to their, their you know, million dollar home, you know, it's like. <laughs> Do you remember that, honey, the day that happened? And so I went in and said to her, we said, listen, the Lord spoke to us and said, he, he said specifically that he wants to give you this couch. She came out, looked in the back of the van began to bawl. Now, she could afford that couch 20 times over. I couldn't, but she, she could. But she was crying, and I said, why are you so tired? She goes, you don't understand. She goes, I was in just the other day, and I was going to buy that couch, and I looked at my husband, and I said, you know what? I really want that, but I don't think the Lord wants me to have it because I don't deserve that couch. Oh, wow. She was having a bit of a crisis there with herself, and I just said, hey, God said he wants you to have this, and it's from him. And it wrecked her. It transformed her life. How many see that was seed that God wanted me, he wanted to bless me so that I could sow it back out? All right? Is that a good, a good story? And so there's, there's this thing that God wants to prosper his people, but unfortunately the enemy wants to keep people in blindness. And we don't hear a lot of teaching about finances. We don't hear a lot of teaching about this kind of stuff. But the, the, the point of the matter is... Um, there, there, there's a lot to learn in the Bible about giving. Amen? And so I want to just look at a quick story. Uh, I'm going to try to do this in about 10 minutes because we want to have a panel as well today. I want to ask some questions to some of you guys. Um, but I want to go with, if you go with me to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. Okay? 
All right. So the Bible says here, Adam knew his wife, Eve. That doesn't mean he just met her, by the way. That means something completely different. Because something happened when he knew her. They conceived and bore Cain. Okay? Just for those of you who don't read the King James, I just wanted to fill you in. Okay. I have acquired a man from the Lord, and then she bore again, and this, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So I want you to say, one was a shepherd, and one was a farmer. So they both had their occupation, okay? Uh, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, Cain was a tiller of the ground, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Verse 4, And also, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Okay? I want you to understand something here. He respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain's offering. And here's the thing. With Cain, it was in the process of time it came to pass. When it was convenient for Cain, the Bible doesn't say that he took the first fruit of, or the first fruits of his harvest. It just says that in the process of time, it came to pass when it was convenient for Cain, when he already made sure he had enough for himself and he took care of his bills and paid his mortgage and took care of, you know, uh, his college fund and all this stuff. And he said, now I have a little bit left over. I'm going to bring this to God in the process of time. I'm going to present this to the Lord. And the God did not receive that offering. But if you look at Abel's offering, it says, Abel brought the first and the best to God. Abel didn't wait to calculate if he was going to have available resources down the road. He said, you know what? The first sheep that is, lamb that is born from this sheep, I'm going to present it to the Lord. Abel didn't, didn't wait and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure this sheep produces four, five, six little lambs, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these four, and this is going to provide for me. I'm going to take the leftovers to God. No, he says, I'm going to take the first. And he said, God, I'm giving you the first and the best, not knowing if this little sheep's going to produce anymore, because my faith is not on the things of this world or on this little sheep. My faith is in you to be my provider. And the Bible said that, um, that he offered this sacrifice in faith right the just shall live by faith in hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 it says this it is impossible say impossible to please god without faith anyone who wants to come to him must believe that god exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him and so abel came with a sincere heart saying god i know you exist and I know that you, you, you reward those who sincerely seek you. And you are so special to me, God. I'm going to take of my first fruits. I'm going to give it to you because you, I'm dependent on you to bring provision in my life. My little sheep, I don't care if they have any more babies. You are my provider and you come first. And I don't care if I have enough because you're going to bring in the increase. And this is the heart that Abel had. It was a heart of faith. Where with Cain, it was like, I'll just give of my overflow. All right? Now, here's the thing. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 tells us what faith is. Okay, this is really cool. Faith is the assurance. It's the title deed or the confirmation of the things that you're hoping for. Okay? And the evidence of things not seen, that's what faith is. So, in other words, if I have $1,000, but I don't have it in my pocket, I don't have it in my wallet, it's not on my desk... But it's in the bank account. I put, it, I, put a, I put money in the bank account and the, little, the ATM machine gave me a little receipt. And on the receipt it says I have $1,000. That little receipt in my hand. I can walk around just as confident, just as assured that, listen, I got $1,000. Even though I don't have it on me, I know it's in the account. I know it's accessible. Why? Because I have a title deed. I have a receipt that says I have the money. So unless TD Canada goes belly up, I know the money's there. And that's what faith is. Faith is saying, listen, I don't have to see the provision of God. I don't have to see that my body is healed. I don't have to see my kids serving God because your word says it and I believe it and I'm looking at it and I'm just as assured as if it was already here. Amen. And that's what faith is. Faith is taking the word of God and saying, Lord, your word says it and I choose to believe it. I'm taking it like a bank receipt. I trust you. All right? 
Romans 4, verse 19 to 20 says, Abraham, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. I don't know about you, but if I was 100 years old, and God came and told, sent an angel to say, you're going to have a baby, I'd struggle a bit with that. I really would. But he wasn't weak in faith, and he was strengthened, believing that, hey, if God said it, he's faithful to do it. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to raise up a people that have faith like that. So here, here's something. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, okay, talks about Abel. Okay? The writer of Hebrews is talking about this incident we read about in Genesis chapter 4. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering. And this is where people get wrong. It wasn't that God didn't accept Cain or Cain's offering. It just wasn't more acceptable. Okay? Offering of God that Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence, okay, that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Do you guys see that? And so I, I love how God actually talks to Cain. I, I just love to see, you see the heart of God in the scriptures. He, he doesn't condemn Cain. He's gentle with Cain. All right? Um, he didn't reject his offspring. He didn't, he didn't put a curse on Cain. But let's see what he said here in verse 5, okay, of Genesis 4, 5. And he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. It means he was depressed, okay? He was jealous of the blessing of God that was on his brother's life. The scripture doesn't tell us, but we see that when Abel's offering was received, some kind of blessing came that was manifested, and Cain was jealous because he didn't receive a blessing, okay? Verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Now, see, God's being a good therapist right here. That's what it is, right? If you go to, ther if you go to therapist, right, they ask you questions to get you to think. God, God already knows all of this stuff, but he's coming, he's being a counselor or a therapist, he's, he's talking to him, and he says, listen, Cain, if you do well, Will you not be accepted? The issue's on your side, okay? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, sin crouches at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Okay? And so what's happening here is envy and jealousy and anger was tempting him, and the Bible says that it was crouching at his door. So my question is, what kind of animal crouches? Animals, right? Cats. They crouch. And the buffalo comes into the Sahara and says, la, la, la. And they see this little, small, little crouched up thing. And they say, there's nothing to worry about. It's just, whatever it is, it's small. But how many know when that thing pounces? Suddenly it's as big as a buffalo. You say, well, I kind of miscalculated that one. <laughs> and, and the Bible says that, that, that sin is very deceitful. And sin lies at the door. And you might think, you know what, I don't have to deal with this little problem in my life of jealousy or envy. or, You know, I can look at those pictures. It's really not going to affect me. It's such a small thing in my life. It's crouching, but it's bigger than you think. And when it pounces on you, you're going to realize the Bible says, hey, we've got to flee from sin. And, and this thing is going to pounce. And, and God says, you need to rule over this thing. Don't let this anger take over your life. Abel gave an acceptable offering because he gave in faith. You gave of your overflow, and I still love you. I want you to work through stuff. I'm not here to condemn you. He didn't say, Cain, you're going to hell. You don't tithe. He didn't say that. Right? Okay? Just to settle you guys down. He's very compassionate. Okay? So there's two ways you can rule, rule over this thing, okay? You can rule over an attack that comes against you, as God told Cain to do. It's called spiritual warfare. 
Did Cain rule over the attack? No, let's see what he did. We're going to read on here. Now Cain talked with his brother Abel, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Okay? And he said, I don't know where, I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper to the Lord? And so he failed in spiritual warfare. How many know we all go through spiritual warfare? How many know that the enemy, the Bible says in, that the enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? Okay? I want to say this here. There's different ways to get to Florida. You can walk to Florida. Are you still going to Florida, Neil? That's awesome. I was actually going to calculate it on Google Maps. How long would it take for me to walk to, like, Jacksonville? I totally forgot. But I guarantee it would take a long time to walk to Florida. How many know you can, get, you can walk to Florida? You can take a car to Florida. It might take about 27 hours, roughly, right? Depending on where you're going. But then you can fly. How many know flying is the most excellent way? All right? Everyone say Amen. Now they're actually talking of building these tunnels that go, that they take, they suck the air out of, and they can fire you across the country in like an hour. And yeah, that's the new thing of transportation that they're working on. My brother's into all that, and he's showing me all the specs and designs so that people don't have to fly. They just get in this tunnel car and just boom, right across. 1,500 miles an hour. So anyway, that's another story. But how many know there's, there's a more excellent way? And so what happens is there's a lot of Christians, the enemy's crouching at their door, the enemy comes to attack, and, and, and what God says, he says to Cain, he says, if you do well, right? If you do well, you will be received, you'll be accepted. And so the Bible said the enemy was crouching at his door because he didn't do well, but Abel didn't have the enemy crouching at his door because he did well. And so there's a more excellent way. And so Christians, I, I, there's so many Christians I talk to, they're, oh, I'm in spiritual warfare, the enemy's attacking, and this is going wrong, and my kids are in this area, and this is happening in my life, and it's like constant attack, constant attack, constant attack. Maybe, if we go back to the scripture, we can find the most excellent way to do spiritual warfare. Can we do that together? Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 to 11, God says, bring all the tithes, into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. One of the things I realized when I stopped just giving of the overflow and I started giving by faith and saying, I'm going to give a tenth, I'm going to give God first, Suddenly, all the attacks, it's like God was doing warfare on my behalf. So I could focus on just living. This is a promise. This is good stuff, guys. Say amen. Amen. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. So I believe if you're a tither, if you're giving God of the first fruits, he himself does your spiritual warfare on your behalf. It's not good news. I really do believe that. You know, do you know what? Do you know what revelation is? Revelation is that when you see something for the first time that you've been staring at for a long time, and you get this "aha!" Uh-huh, I see it. And there came a time where I had that "aha" uh-huh moment, like "oh man, I never saw this before." That's like. There's, there's provision, there's protection. That God, if, if I honor God with the first fruits, then it sets me up for protection. God himself will defend my account as I take care of his account. Does that make sense? So God is faithful. Um, so I wanted to do this morning, um, I want to have a little bit of a panel. So before we do that, we're just going to watch a little video clip. And while that video clip's being played, I'm going to ask, um, it's John, you're coming up. And those who I ask will just come and sit up here while the video's going. Very good. Awesome. So if you guys want to come, that'd be great. Grab a mic. 
Yeah, I'd put a, put a couple chairs. That'd be great. Put it on this side because if you're under the speaker, it'll go crazy on you. Just come over here. Awesome. So, um, I just wanted to kind of have, you can throw those up in the back there so they can see you or whatever. That's good. Awesome. So, yeah, I just wanted to talk about this. And I, I was just doing some statistics looking at, um, uh, you know, giving and what, what giving looks like in the church. Uh, not this church in particular, but overall. In North America, and they're saying that since 1990, from, from the 90s to now, 1990 till now, there's been a 50% decrease in giving. 50% decrease in giving. So giving has gone down, and um, they say tithers only make up about 10 to 25% of any congregation. Um, only 10 to 25% of families in the church tithe, but they often provide 50 to 80% of the church's funds. Now, I, in regards to our church, I didn't go look and we didn't go as a board and crunch numbers. Or I'm just saying this is statistically what, um, what's out there, okay? Eight to ten people who give to churches have zero credit card debt, um, which is really significant because I think um, if we would learn to maybe budget better, maybe there's things we need to learn as, you know, uh, society puts pressure to buy and have the best thing and keep up with the Joneses. If we could teach people how to budget better, take care of their finances uh, better, they, w- they would have more to give. I don't know. We're going to discuss this. Uh, on average, Christians give 2, 2.5% of their income to churches. Um, and so I guess, I guess what I want to do is ask just a few questions. And Paulette, Paulette we know... She works with fundraising for a job. She's been doing that for years, so she, I'm sure she has some great insight. John is on our board of directors, runs a business, and Ben and Kaylee um, as well. You guys are giving to the Lord. So just wanted to get your feedback. Maybe the first question I'm going to ask you is, was there a time that you started giving uh, and got a revelation of this this whole thing of giving your first words? And Scott and Tennille, you're supposed to be up here too, so trying to hide on me there so yeah so if you want to pass the mic if any of you want to share the time that um that became real to you and what kind did it make a significant change uh basically did malachi come true is it true that god did god open the windows that he provide for you so i'll leave that that question out and if anyone who wants to answer that you can pass the mic the question was, was there a time like that you got a revelation of, of giving unto the Lord, like tithing? And did you see the blessings, as Malachi says, uh, windows open? And can you share a testimony about that? Scott's hiding in the back there. But you... This is good. Um, yeah, would you see them better? I'm good right here. I'm good right here. Okay. Well, I'm sure you are. Good you can right hear my voice. <laughs> I, I, I can say um, there, there's been a time, uh, 20 years... <laughs> There we go. Oh, we're going to put the high guys in the back. Okay. Well, sit on John's lap. <laughs> okay, for about 20 years, um, my wife and I have never tied, to be honest. Uh, we were, we're Christians, um, but I had a hard time with it. Um, I always put my bills, my family, my groceries, whatever, first, not God. Um, we moved up here two and a half, three years ago, and it was uh, Pure and Candy that invited us. I always pick on you guys, sorry, but th- they invited us over for lunch, and they told us their story on how they almost, they pretty much lost everything, but they had their little kitty for their ties. Always had tith- tithing. Janelle and I went home that, that after, Sunday afternoon, fell on the floor, to our, just bawling and crying, and, and, and asking God to forgive us of 20 years of robbing them. I said to you know, no matter what now, we're, we're, we're paying our tithes. I don't care about my bill. I do care about my bills, but God's coming first. Putting God first. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was a situation that came up where I had to pay this bill, but I said, nope, I'm giving to God first. The bill can wait. A couple days later, um, this, this blessing, this huge blessing came to Tanil and I. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm calling my wife at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, she says, you better be hurt or something. Call me at 4 o'clock in the morning. You better, something better be wrong with you. And I just, you better be dead. I said, hon, I said, God just blessed us. It, it, this, 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 is, this is like huge. It was huge. I, I don't want to elaborate too much, but it was just, it was a great blessing. Um, 
So my, my, my theory is uh, God's number one in our lives now. It's, it's always tied to, tied to Him first. It's Amen. biblical. Um, I don't care about my bills. I do, but it's God's first. Because look where, look, look, look where He's brought us, right? Amen. You want to say anything or no? You're good? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Ben, did you want to share? Um, I grew up in the church, um, so I guess for me, the revelation is I've always seen my parents tithe faithfully, um, and we I never went out without as a child. I mean, we had a bit of good growing up, and I saw my parents' faith with tithing that, I mean, we always had food, we always had everything, so it was never, um, it was kind of just implanted in me as I was growing up, and then uh, when I moved down here, I moved in with my aunt and uncle, and the same thing with them, they always tithe faithfully, and then same thing with them, God's always blessed them. Um, when Kay and I got married, um, she was new to, to the Christian faith, and um, I mean, we started tithing together. I mean, and God's blessed us, I mean, wholeheartedly. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are without tithing. Uh, we believe that strong uh, for the whole heart because uh, it's all God. Like, my job, her job, our work is it's all God. God blessed us with work, blessed me with hands to do my work, so why not give Him what's already His? So That's good. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we started tithing when we first got married. We hadn't tithed at all before that. Our, we didn't really think about it much, but we got some good teaching on it, and um, we started tithing right away. And then I got a little sideways on that one. I, I started thinking, hey, this is a good investment. It's so actually, you know, if I tithe, the Lord promises to bring back. And so I started tithing more with the the attitude that it's better than the stock market. You know, this is, this is good stuff. And, uh, um, the Lord really arrested me on that, and it, it really checked my spirit about about tithing and, and why you tithe and what what it's about. It's not about first of all, it doesn't need our money, and and secondly, it's like Pastor said, it's an opportunity to give, and what that does, it opens up doors for you. And so I I, I got that in line over, over time, and um, then when I retired from my my job, we started our own business, and that was a step of faith and we have seen things that we've never seen in our whole married life happen to us. Uh, timely uh, money coming in, uh, c- contracts with customers that are really, really solid, um, employees coming, employees going, but it, the, the thing is we had, we had uh, what we needed all the time. And I had to think about, I ran across a, a, a psalm here a while ago, it was a psalm uh, 37 verse 25 it says I'm old well, sorry, let me start over I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their, or their offspring begging bread and that's true I've never seen the, the righteous forsaken or their offspring begging bread and I've been around in a few places and one place has been for a while was Africa and I've seen starvation but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their, or their offspring begging bread yeah, that's no, good. For myself, um, learning how to tithe came after I first got saved. Um, I was in a very uh, desperate situation. Um, I had lost absolutely everything, completely bankrupt, home, you name it, it was gone. And um, I remember sitting in my pastor's church at that time in the office and just sharing my heart. And so he said, you know what, I want you to come and we're going we're gonna to teach you about the blessings of tithing. And I know that you're in a very desperate situation right now, but I promise you, if you will follow these principles, God will turn this around. And he did in so many, many abundant ways over the years. Um, but where tithing really um, became fruitful in my life was when Owen and I got together and um, uh, it, tithing to Owen was very foreign and um, he was very much about, you know, you take care of family first and you pay your bills and you never carry debt. And he was very, very adamant and strict about it. And so I, I remember sharing with him and saying, well, I'm going to tithe. I'm continuing my tithing. Whether you choose to or not, I'm continuing to tithe. And there was a business situation that came up and I said to Owen, I know you want this, this particular situation to go very favorable for you and for the business. And it was big. 
And he said, yes. And I said, I want you to promise God that if this comes through, and this was thousands and thousands of dollars, if this comes through, that you will give the first 10% to God. And I can remember him kind of laughing and saying, sure, okay, because he really believed it was not going to happen. And I remember going into my prayer closet and saying, okay, I put it out there. So, uh, you know, I'm leaving this to you now, Lord, because, you know, he doesn't think this is going to happen. Well, not only did the deal come through, but it ended up being a lot more than what they thought. And so then when he had to give the 10%, it was like, okay. And so, and he did it. But then what came out of that was even more. The following week, a bigger job that was even more than that came through. And he said, oh, my goodness, there's something to this given away. <laughs> so, and now he, he fruitfully gives the tithe. That's awesome. That's really, really good. And, you know, it doesn't mean that if, if you're a tither, just like, I mean, you're still going to have your challenges and you're going to have to work through issues, but you're going to be far better off. God will do more with the 90 than you could do with the 100%, right? And I know for my wife and I, even in the last few years, we've had our kids in the Christian school, and she was trying to, uh, she had a job, for, but things didn't work out, and so uh, with that job at the time, and so we were, we were a little tight, and we ran up a bit of debt in, in putting our kids through the Christian school, and, and it, it's been a bit of a struggle, but I think um, uh, we had to make a decision, because we've had, we had Christians come into us and say, you know, most people send their kids to the Christian school, they just use their tithe money to pay for their tuition. I said, you know what? We, we won't do that because the first fruit belongs to the storehouse. We're going to give to God and then we're going to believe for this. And so, you know, we've, we're setting down some stuff and, and we're meeting with someone even in the next little while just to do some budgeting because we want to make sure. So you still got to budget. You still have to plan. You still have to do practical things. Uh, but God will do more with the 90, right? Than you can do with the 100%. Uh, from your experience, Paulette, in, in the industry of fundraising, how do you think we could help people best to encourage them to begin, even if they begin giving like 5% and they move to 8 and just begin to step in? How would you, what would you say would be a good s stepping stone for people? Sure. Um, we come across this quite a bit in the fundraising world um, where people want to give. And um, so there's, there's a few things that uh, we share with people. But one of the things that um, I, I want to start with is that um, giving really is typically, especially in the philanthropy world of fundraising and giving to the church and giving to charities, is that you have to find that common denominator of what stirs the passion within you. And so when I think about it, um, many of you here received this in grade five, and it was the, the red Bible that they gave out, the Gideons gave out. And so what we see um, is that people have never forgotten that first Bible that they received and how the gospel literally changed their lives. And so when Pastor Travis talks about, you know, the starting out small with, you know, a small number and working towards it, I can remember an employee that I had at World Vision and I wanted her to, she had come into a new department and wanted her to read some manuals. And she said to me, she said, I don't read. And I said, you don't read or you can't read? And she said, no, I can read, but I don't read. And I said, oh, why is that? And she said, because she said, I just, I find it's too hard. And I said, so let me ask you a question. I said, do you tithe to your church? She said, oh, yes. And I said, 10%? She says, actually, we tithe more than 10%. So I said, you understand the principle? She goes, yeah, very much. I said, well, then that's what we're going to do with reading. I said, you see this big manual? Well, this is like the 10%. But I said, we're not going to start you with the 10%. I said, because God wants to know that you are faithful in what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start you with 1%. So we started with a two-page document. I said, I want you to go and read this. And I said, and then we're going to discuss it. So she did. So then we slowly increased the volume of what she was giving. So then it went to 2%. So she was reading a little bit more. And slowly over time, she was actually reading the manuals and doing it faithfully. And I can remember her husband at an event saying to me, he said, I am so happy that Sani is reading. 
And I said, oh, why is that? He said, because now we talk about things that we've never talked about before because she's reading things in magazines, she's reading mm-hmm. things in books, she's reading things in, you know, in all kinds of areas. And we have these wonderful conversations about what she's reading. And he said, the way that you did it, she could understand it by knowing that it was the same principle <clears throat> as what she used in tithing that she would do in her reading. Well, it's the same way when you give your giving. You know, it's being faithful, and that's what God is really looking for. Looking for the heart. You make that commitment Mm -hmm. to say, God, this week and for the next 10 weeks, I'm going to give $5 to somebody. God doesn't total up the amount that you've given. He totals up, did you do faithfully what you promised you were going to do? And the reward comes from that faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing in giving the tithe. Is that maybe you're not at that level of 10% giving. But you need to start so -hmm. that God can then empower you and to show you that he wants you to do more. Amen. And as as you said earlier, it's not just about the giving of money. It's so many areas of our lives of giving. Giving God the first fruits. For sure. For sure. That's really good, Paulette. That's awesome. You know, they're saying here that, um, you know, at 2.5% uh, of Christians giving, um, giving a 25 on average, Christians give, uh, they said here, and this is not to bring guilt. Like, you look at these statistics, I feel guilt. It's not about that. It's about just looking at the facts and realizing that if people would increase their giving to even 10%, this is what they said they could do in North America, there would be an additional $165 billion raised. That would be $25 billion would relieve global hunger, starvation, and death from preventable diseases in five years. $12 billion would eliminate illiteracy in five years. $15 billion could solve the world's water sanitation issues. Okay, $1 billion uh, would, that are living right now on less than a dollar a day in the, in the world. $1 billion could f- fully fund all overseas mission works. $110 billion would still be left over in additional for ministry expenses and building Donald Trump's wall on the southern border. No, I'm joking. No, no. It's a joke. It's a joke. So, there, so I'm saying, like, it, so what could the church do if we mobilized and we just became, say, God, help us to be more generous in 2019? And what happens, in, we're, we're funding, and then there's, there's a harvest coming back into our life, and you create this cycle of generosity that begins to flow in the church. Amen? And so, I guess more than anything, that's our um, challenge. So, I'm going to ask you guys: Do you have any final words or testimony, encouragement for anybody? (laughs) So, my biggest thing is that we don't have to worry about um, having money like in our bank account, like it's. We tithe faithfully every week, and just to think that I'm 23 years old, and I don't need to worry about not having money, and I think that's, like, amazing, (laughs) just coming from, like, a family who didn't have much, and when I first started coming to church, I'd, like, if I had whatever, like, cash, like, because we didn't have the debit machines then, but whatever cash I had in my wallet, I was like, eh, just just give it away, (laughs) (laughs) whatever, like, they need the money, right, and I tried to do that, like, a lot, and then... We got together in the debit machine, so obviously we tithe more now, but it just definitely giving in faith and knowing that, you know, I don't need to worry about those bills. Like, I just give the money because it belongs to God, and he's definitely blessed us, like, so much that I have no student debt. I went to college, and afterwards, like, I was able to pay it off, and I just, I believe it was God, because God gave me that job after I got mm-hmm. into college, and, like, the job I have now is from God, like he's he's blessing us. So it's just yeah. Awesome. Amen. Amen. Danielle? She's there to make you look good, Scott. That's it's your better half, right? So it's good. I, just, I want to close with this. Um, in the fundraising circle, every year we get given goals. And those goals don't go down. (laughs) Those goals go up and Mm -hmm. up and up. And when I started in the the whole sector in the industry of fundraising, 
I dedicated um, my my career to the Lord at that time, and I said, Lord, in fundraising, they're going to give us a goal, and it's going to be a big one, and I know it. So I know that you are the creator of all, and mm -hmm. that you actually own this goal, and that you want to see it fulfilled. So our teams would come, my teams would come together, and we would pray, and we put the number up on the board, and we would pray about the number, and then we would commit it and give it to God, and then we would erase the number off the board, mm -hmm. and then we'd roll up our sleeves and we'd go to work, mm -hmm. knowing and believing that God would fulfill the goal. And I can really promise you this, that if you take that kind of mindset, God will hear you and he will fulfill it. And I've been in the industry now almost 20 years. And we have yet to not meet God's goal. Amen. That's awesome. Thank you, Paul. Let's give them a hand as they go. Thank you guys so much for helping us out. How do you guys, do you guys like the panel idea? Do you like that? It's good to hear other people than just me. But I want to just say this in closing, you know, when I brought this message, this was not something that, you know, we're, we're a generous church for the most part. Like I really, we've, we've, uh, we've done a lot. Uh, and we've put out a call for some certain things. I remember Mary, we put out a call for Mary's medication, and you guys gave generously, you gave generously to help the Anglican Church and the New Life Girls Home. So we're a generous church. So this isn't preaching at an issue. This is just laying foundation. The Bible says we need to preach the full counsel of God, and so I needed to bring this message so that we can be challenged to look at our hearts and say, are we giving with generosity. And as Paul said, he says, I don't give you this command to give as a commandment. He wants it to be from the heart, the grace of it. So let's stand and let's pray. And uh, if, if anyone needs any prayer, our prayer team will be in the corner over there. You need prayer for anything in particular, we will pray with you. Father, I thank you for this wonderful uh, day, God. We thank you, Lord, that as we, uh, that we're being challenged in this year as we go forth, God, to, to be sowing in your vineyard, to be giving, and to, uh, Father, and we thank you, Lord, that we'll reap a harvest. But that's not why we give. We give because you, uh, you, everything belongs to you anyway, Father. And we give the first fruits of our lives, and we commit ourselves Help us to grow in this thing. Help us to grow in the grace of generosity. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.